Um, now, in the first test for our hybrid um, model, uh, hopefully, we shall have Professor Pete Smith from Aberdeen and the Souls Are Great programme appear on the screen. Thank you. And I think you're on mute. That's 20 minutes for the person who had that on the sweepstake. Not on my machine. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, I wasn't on mute, by the way, so you can claim that money back on the sweepstake. So I'm joining you as a big disembodied head, like the scary uh, bloke in The Wizard of Oz. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you today uh, about is souls are great. So can we have the first slide, please? Can we have the first slide, please? Technical issues. Thanks very much, yeah. So Souls are Great was a collaboration between the University of Aberdeen, SRUC, uh, Cranfield University, the University of Edinburgh, Newcastle University, um, CCAPS, which is part of the CGIR program, and the James Hutton Institute. And Soils are Great was, um, stands for Soils Research to Deliver Greenhouse Gas Removals and Abatement Technologies. It doesn't really fit, but we had to squeeze all the words in to just get that excellent acronym. Um, a number of people are involved and they're listed on this slide. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? The slides don't seem to be showing in the room which is annoying. Are they showing? Ah, Sorry, Pete, great. I'm not sure you can hear me. They are showing in the screen, yeah. Oh, that's great. I could only see my big disembodied head. So um, the next slide, please, that will be the one which shows um, the, uh, the structure of the project outline. Is that the one you're on now? Yeah. I hope so. Right, so uh, the, the project first um, uh, assessed the land and the biomass resource that was available for soil-based soil greenhouse gas removal. Um, then we had a collection of uh, three work packages which identified the most promising options, assessed the socioeconomic and socio-cultural and ecological impacts of those land-based greenhouse gas removals and we quantified the technical potential for each uh, soil-based GGR. We then put those for, through a full life cycle uh, to, to assess the full GGR impact. And then we also assessed the economic potential, so the constraints that were imposed by the economics of the situation, and also assessed the policy and the uh, uh, social constraints that would prevent any of these GGR options from being applied. And the final work package was to uh, synthesize them. Uh, next slide, please. So the first one was defining the practices. Um, next slide, please. So for this one, we had, um, uh, we had to look for the mitigation measures that were going to go into the marginal abatement cost curves and would also define the, the uh, measures that we would look at in the project. So we had a list of measures um, from which we could derive a series of actual on the ground practices. And this led to a number of pathways which would either um, increase carbon inputs or reduce carbon losses. And this was published in a paper in Global Change Biology. But this set the framework really for the, for the, the, uh, the interventions that we examined and that we quantified the potential for. Um, next slide, please. So we came up with a list of 20 that we wanted to look, to look at. Um, most of them were um, soil management, sort of in, uh, uh, in the field management. Uh, for example, residue management, uh, nutrient management, organic amendments. But a number, a number of them were um, uh, other interventions uh, which involved the soil. For example, looking at carbonation and um, adding biochar, for example. And, and some of them, in, uh, uh, looked also at not just what happened in the soil, but what, what happened in the um, uh, above ground vegetation in the case of agroforestry and the hedges. 
Next slide, please. So um, the first step was to model the impacts of the changes in the practices to assess the biophysical potential. Next slide, please. So for this, we use the ACOS model, which is a, a, a model of carbon, carbon and nitrogen dynamics. In fact, it's a, a process-based soil biogeochemistry model. Um, it runs on a monthly time step, and it has uh, simple drivers, which are readily available, including the metadata, soil information, information on above ground biomass and management, and it runs with gridded inputs. So we were able to run it at different spatial scales, uh, which we did either in case studies, which I'll show a few examples of, or globally. Next slide, please. So first thing we had to do, obviously, was validate it. The model's been fairly well um, evaluated uh, in a number of previous projects, uh, but in order to test it out, um, in order to evaluate it and validate it, um, for this project, there are a number of new environments and new practices for which it hadn't been evaluated. So this is just an example for the sugarcane residues and sugarcane burning. We used some data um, from Brazil um, to, to, uh, to uh, evaluate changes in soil carbon. And you can see the measured versus the observed uh, soil carbon there. And we get really quite a good, uh, a good fit. The other statistics are available. This is just to give you an example. So having validated the model in a, a range of environments in which it hadn't been previously tested. Next slide, please. We went, we went on to run it globally. So this is just an example of looking at no-till in wheat. So this is one, one run of uh, multiple runs. So we have uh, hundreds of maps, which we're still putting together and pulling together to synthesize. So this is the example of wheat with no-till, and it's looking at the in relationship to the uh, current situation. And you can see various increases there of up to about 4 tons, uh, 4.4 4, uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year, um, quite often lower than that. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, this is again uh, another run, which is uh, looking uh, at, uh, at no-till um, with, a, with a similar similar slide. But we have this, um, we have this for um, all crops, uh, we have it across the, uh, the areas of which these crops are grown, and we have it for a number of interventions. Um, but these are just two examples um, that I'm showing you today. Um, next slide, please. For grasslands, we uh, used a different model. We used the Dalek model. Next slide, please. So for this, we used a data assimilation approach. We used the Dalek uh, system, which is data assimilation linked ecosystem carbon model developed in Edinburgh. And we used model and satellite data, um, LIA data from satellites, and we fused these together to get results for wheat, maize and soybeans, and also for grasslands. Um, so I'll just give you an example of the grasslands. So basically, it's a model um, which, which ingests information that's available from satellite data, and it can update the predictions by um, assimilating that data and adjusting the uh, probability distributions from the prior distributions to allow more accurate um, estimation of the outputs. So an example is shown on the next slide. Next slide, please. This is an example of uh, calibrating and testing that model um, from the grassland productivity and management data from North Wyke, uh, Rothamsted North Wyke. Um, so this is uh, the data showing the, um, the measured and the modeled values. And we seem to capture the management interventions and the interannual variability quite well. So that's, uh, uh, that's been published uh, as a validation paper. So the next step is to apply that um, more widely to cover our grassland, uh, the, the global grassland biome, to, uh, to, to assess the potential uh, for soil carbon sequestration there. Next slide, please. So some of these other interventions, which aren't to do with conventional soil management, carbonation, enhanced weathering, and biochar, we had a number of um, a number of uh, uh, parts of the project which looked at looked at these in various detail, which included um, including biochar in uh, an adapt adaptation of the Roth C model. Uh, so these are three great examples of life cycle assessments that were done looking at carbonation, enhanced weathering, and biochar. Uh, led by the University of Cranfield team, but involving Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Uh, next slide, please. The first one was assessing the potential for soil carbonation and enhanced weathering through life cycle assessment. And um, we conducted this, uh, this study in Sao Paulo State in Brazil. 
and that results, the results of that were published in uh, the Journal of Cleaner Production. Next slide, please. The next, next one we also looked at in Brazil, this was published in Scientific Reports, which was looking at carbon sequestration using biochar from sugarcane residues um, in Brazil. And the next LCA, uh, next slide, please. The next LCA approach, we use an anticipa anticipatory life cycle assessment of the use of biochar from sugarcane residues as a GGR technology, again in Brazil. Uh, so there's a session this afternoon, two sessions, in fact, one in the room and one online on LCA. So we'll be returning to some of these LCA issues and how it feeds through into the GGRD program uh, later today in that breakout group, if you're interested. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the next one, the next, the next part of it, and the final part, which I'm going to focus on, is the cost, cost benefit analysis and developing the marginal abatement cost curves. So this was largely done by colleagues in SRUC. Um, next slide, please. And what this did, uh, this is just the preliminary soil carbon sequestration marginal abatement cost curve. And for those of you who don't know what they are, uh, it's basically looking at the abatement potential of different interventions and looking at the cost savings or the costs associated with those effort, uh, those interventions and putting them together on a cost curve so that you can see that what can be achieved, how much abatement can be achieved with different interventions at different carbon costs, different carbon prices. So we're able to compare all of the, all of the interventions. Um, and this is an example looking at UK wheat. And of course the cost change, depending upon where you're looking at the production uh, of different crops in different regions. Uh, but this is just an example for UK wheat. Um, so it shows that we have the potential to integrate these into um, wider um, economic and biophysical models to assess the economic potential. So the last slide, please. So just in summary, I've just given you a real whistle-stop tour. I've not really included any science because it's all described in the publications. There are 65 journal publications to date with many more in review, in revision, and a few more still in preparation. And this includes two papers uh, from Soils Are Great, which were published in Nature, one in Science, four in Nature Sustainability, four in Nature Climate Change, one in Nature Communications, one in Global Environmental Change, and 13 in Global Change Biology, and many more in uh, disciplinary journals. Um, there's still some work to do, despite the fact that we finished the project nearly a year ago. We've still got uh, finished the papers and published them. We've still got a number of papers that we're still working on. Um, we've got to pull all the threads together in a synthesis paper. And this is, I gave a talk similar to this um, nearly a year ago. So that's my bad, but that hasn't yet been done. Still pulling those threads together. And I think that could be a really high impact paper. And we've got to make sure that this doesn't um, end here. It doesn't end with the, the, the end of the Souls of Great program. We need to make sure that we can feed our inputs into the GGRD projects going forward. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for the technical hitches at the beginning. I'll leave it there.